everybody, I'm Chef AJ and welcome to Healthy Living. My guest today is Robbie Barbero. Robbie has been living with type 1 diabetes since 2002 and has been eating a low fat, plant based diet since 2006. He is the co founder of Mastering Diabetes and is a diabetes coach that helps people with all types of diabetes master their blood sugar and achieve their best health possible. Well, that sounds really good. It, and thanks for having me here. Uh, it is good. We get amazing results. Uh, this program works, so I'm excited to talk about it. I can't wait to hear about it, but I'm confused because I always thought type 1 diabetes, which was used, used to be known as juvenile diabetes, was for kids. And while you are young, you're not a child. So how does an adult get type 1 diabetes? Yeah, that's a great question. So it used to be the distinction between type 1 and type 2 was there was juvenile diabetes and there was adult onset diabetes. And what happened is young kids started to get type 2 mm -hmm. and older adults started to get type 1. Got all and we, we can easily explain and understand what's going on uh, for type 2, like why young kids are getting type 2. Basically, it's simply insulin resistance. We can go into that. Um, but exactly why uh, older people are starting to get people out. We have clients that have gotten diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in their 60s. Uh, so it's crazy. So the medical community really doesn't know what causes type 1 diabetes. There's a strong link between dairy and type 1 diabetes, and Dr. Michael Greger's covered that, Neil Barnard, a lot of research on that. But uh, there's really nothing conclusive uh, in the same way that we know exactly what causes type 2 diabetes. So uh, right now... Uh, I was diagnosed when I was 12, turning 13, wow. but uh, somebody can diagnose with type 1 at any time. Type 1 diabetes is basically uh, your pancreas has been damaged, and the beta cells are not producing sufficient amount of insulin. So that's what happened to me uh, when I was 12, turning 13, and it's happening to people at all kinds of ages. So what symptoms does one need to look for? Uh, you know, I know with type 2, I have friends that, that, that you know, excessive thirst, excessive sure. urination. So how is type 1 and type 2 different, and what should people be looking for symptom-wise? Yeah, so type 1 is actually the same thing. Uh, so type 1, you're having, they have a, by the time you're going to get type 1, your blood glucose is probably in the 400, 500, 600, where it should be somewhere between, you know, 70, 120, or 80, 130, somewhere in that range. Uh, so when I got diagnosed, I was in the high 400s. Um, and basically, you have the same problem. You are super thirsty, and you're urinating all the time, and usually people are losing a lot of weight that they shouldn't be losing. And that's what happened to you? Is it, is it like, did you notice this? Did you tell your parents, or how, how you know? Yeah, so my older brother, I have two older brothers. Uh, my middle brother has type 1 as well. Interesting. So what happened is, I actually, I used his blood glucose meter to test myself. After I had been complaining for several weeks to my mom, like, Mom, I, I'm super thirsty, I'm going to the bathroom, I think I might have type 1, just like my brother. And uh, she said, no, no, don't be silly. Oh. And then eventually I tested myself, and I was in the 400s, and my brother was like, yep, you have type 1, so pack your bags, and we're going to the hospital. Oh, my God. Thank goodness that you were smart enough to know to do that. And you, and you yeah, didn't. things could have gotten because, worse. Because There's I, a lot of horror stories out there, people being undiagnosed for an extended period of time. Yeah, I, I have a a friend that that well, it wasn't type one, but it was type two undiagnosed, and then she, she went blind. You know, by yeah. the time she got to the doctor, that part wasn't reversible. So, yeah. how do they distinguish? Like, so when you go to the doctor and you have these symptoms, because you're saying that type one and type two present similarly, how do yeah. they figure out your type one or type two or even what you're calling now type one point five? Yeah. So there's two different things. The the most common thing is a C peptide test. And a C-peptide test indicates uh, how much p insulin your own pancreas is producing. So basically the simple way to understand is your body produces insulin and then the C-peptide breaks off and that would only happen if you produce the insulin. So if you're injecting insulin, there's no C-peptide involved in that process. So you get a C-peptide test, if your number is very low, you know, below 0.5, below 0.8, depending on the test you're using, um, then you clearly, your pancreas has been damaged and you're not producing sufficient amounts. Uh, whereas if somebody's an early stage type 2, uh, they'll actually see a super high amount of insulin above, like, you know, above 3.2, I mean, it could be in the 4s or 5s, uh, you can see a high number there. Um, another way to test, another important test people are doing right now, is antibody tests. So um, type 1 diabetes is, in the medical community teaches, it's an autoimmune disease, and so that there's antibodies that, uh, this is the way the theory goes, nobody can prove this, but uh, that there are antibodies that are damaging the beta cells. So they look for GAD uh, antibodies and IA2 antibody. Those are the two common ones. There's a couple of ones they can look for. But uh, yeah, it's basically testing for antibodies and a C-peptide test. 
was this devastating for you as a 13 year old? You're just like not even at high school yet or, or because your brother had this, you sort of knew the drill and were. Yeah. It's, I think my parents are probably the most influential in just saying that, Hey, you know, it's just an inconvenience. Don't worry about it. I think so the way that they dealt with it made it so it wasn't a big deal and they didn't overreact about it and they didn't, you know, over, you know, analyze you know, me all the time and ask me questions and they sort of, and I was a responsible kid. So didn't really need to. Um, but, you know, yeah, having seen my brother, have a, he was had a great quality of life with type 1, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that bad. Were, were you living in California at the time? I was actually living in Minnesota at that time. So did you go, like, to the Mayo Clinic, or? I sure did. So, yeah, classic. Uh, my parents wanted to give me the best care possible, so they sent me to the Mayo Clinic. We'd go, I think it was every six months, and see a whole team of doctors, a nutritionist, a uh, psychiatrist, or psychologist, um, and, you know, the endocrinologist and all this stuff. So, you know, and looking back, it's very disappointing to see that, you know, the, the best medical care isn't talking about plant-based nutrition. So they just, you know, what happened, I had the same experience most type 1s have is you get diagnosed, the doctor tells you, oh, don't worry about it, you're still going to be normal just like everybody else, you can eat whatever you want, just take insulin and kind your carbs. So nice. four years after being diagnosed, that would, that would be 2006, so you're now 17, you find out about a plant-based diet, is that correct? Yeah, so I had like made small changes, probably starting at around the age 14 or 15 or so. I started learning and everything on my journey was sort of just, it kept on making sense. Like every step was okay. Somebody said, somebody taught me that, oh, our soil is very devoid of nutrients, so you should take supplements. Like, okay, fine, there's some logic there. And then somebody's like, you know, grass-fed beef is better than beef from that's in a factory. You know, it's like, okay, fine, that's better. Oh, and then somebody's like, well, hey, uh, raw milk is better than pasteurized milk because, you know, we didn't have pasteurization in the past and we were evolving. It's like, okay, fine, sure, whatever. You know, like, oh, you know, MSG is bad and Adidas are bad. So I was making small lifestyle modifications. So eventually I was doing a Weston Price type of diet. I was a member of their organization and doing like taking a, you know, like a turkey and like roasting it and making, you know, broth and all this stuff. And raw milk and grass-fed beef and I was making all my own meals, you know, very consciously, you know, you know, eating, you know, making sure, like, I knew every ingredient that was going in my body. I wasn't eating a packaged garbage. And I was, um, I was a freshman at the University of Florida at this point, and I was on a forum on the internet, and I was telling people, it was like a, it was like a high-end green living website. Say you wanted to buy, like, a bamboo table or something for your house or, you know, whatever. And... I was telling them there was a forum, and they, this is, these people were sort of into raw foods, like gourmet raw foods on this forum. And I was explaining to them why I thought milk was necessary and healthy. I just, this is what I learned. This is what I learned from the Western Price people. I was just telling them my thoughts at the time. And they were very nice, and people replied and said, you know, their answers. And somebody said, hey, have you seen the movie Earthlings? And uh, said, no, so I went and I watched it for free on Google Video. I have since bought the video to support Sean and that great project. <laughs> Very important. But I went and I watched the video, and it just blew my mind. I got I, I got sick for a few days. I had like grass fed beef in my freezer and had a hard time finishing that. And I just couldn't believe that. I thought, hey, I'm a pretty smart kid. Like I got into a really great college that was not easy to get into. And it's like, how could I not know about this information? So I went back to the forum and I was like, okay, these guys know something that I don't know, I'm willing, I'm interested in your information, like what can you tell me about nutrition? And that set me down the path of then starting to learn from a wide range of experts uh, about plant-based nutrition. Well, that's so interesting that your entry point was an ethical entry point because, yes. um, you know, right now you're totally, I mean, not that you're not ethical as well, but your your business and how yeah. you help people is, is health. And I've always said, Robbie, many times that if people watched Forks Over Knives, Cowspiracy and Earthlings, there's no way they couldn't be vegan yeah. immediately. I mean, the, you know, the holy trinity of movies. So yes. that's great. I didn't, I'm so glad I, that we were just at a party together and I said, don't talk to me because I'm interviewing you next week. I don't know anything. <laughs> so this is really, this is so interesting. Yeah. So then you obviously uh, became healthier because you 
adopted the plant-based diet, but how did you get into the particular version of the plant-based diet you followed, which really isn't all that different from mine. There's one little tweak, but we're, yeah. we're sort of, because we had dinner together and I could see we're, we're pretty much pretty close on the same diet. So yes, tell us about absolutely. the evolution. I, about I see, a, I see a, a stand behind you, like you're, like you're actually sitting in a fruit store yeah. and people aren't going to believe that diabetics can eat fruit, especially type ones. And I think that's uh, saying, cause you eat a lot of it. So yes. Yes. We got to talk about that. So uh, the reason, the, how I found I landed on this version of plant-based nutrition, as you know, there's nuanced differences between various experts, but at the end of the day, we're really doing, all doing the same thing. And I like to unite people more than emphasize the differences because in general, our whole plant-based community is literally like less than 1% no. of the United States population. So to fight amongst each other is silly. It drives me crazy I, I, when they fight about potatoes and nuts when, you know, hello, 95% to 99% of you guys agree. So Yeah, that's who it is. Emphasize the points we agree on. Let's get people to implement the things we agree on. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, if there's, you know, uh, a, a, a goal that has not been achieved, then we can get into nuances, which is what a perfect example of what you are. I mean, you started to change the nuts, you sort of switch, you know, more like a McDougal style, and you achieved an additional goal. Mm -hmm. But before then, it wasn't, you, you'd already dealt with a lot of other stuff. You already had done, got to an amazing place. So, mm -hmm. you know, I like to focus on our similarities. But here, what happened to me is the reason I was making those lifestyle changes in the first place and became a Weston Price member and was eating those foods. Uh, you know, while going through high school and going through college and making all my own food. And the, the reason I was dedicated is because at some point in high school, I was randomly shopping at Barnes & Noble to pick up some books for high school, like a Spark Notes or something. And there's a book that just called out to me, and I picked it up. It was called uh, Cures They Don't Want You to Know About by Kevin Trudeau. And this guy was, he was doing like infomercials at the time. He was like a big deal. It's kind of a little scammy if you look at it, you know. But for some reason, that book called to me. And I read that book, and there was somewhere, I, I have to like find the version. I'm sure the versions have changed, but at somewhere in that book, planted a seed in my mind that I could reverse type 1 diabetes. It planted a seed in my mind that it's possible. And I had this mindset that, you know, somebody had to break the four-minute mile. So Roger Bannister, when he, when he was trying to achieve a four-minute mile, the smartest people in the world, this, all the scientists, all the knowledge said that is not possible. You cannot do that. Your heart's going to basically explode. You can't do it. And then once he did it, all of a sudden people run four hundred miles left, right, right. It's not a big deal anymore. So it's sort of like the space program. I mean, once some man went into space, everybody was able. To absolutely. Go to space. So so you know that was that was my motivation. That so I got I went on this you know just dedication tirade of like I'm going to do everything I possibly can to have perfect health. So. You know, I started coming across a body of knowledge I'm sure you're familiar with called natural hygiene. Yes. It's kind of like the field where Alan Goldhammer right. comes from a little bit. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, again, there's nuanced problems with all these various approaches and differences. But I, I'm still not going to say I like practice natural hygiene right now. But that body of knowledge at that time in my life was basically saying you, your body heals itself. So what you need to do, and, and digestion is the most energy intensive thing that we do. So if you can ease your digestion and have a very clean diet, then you're opening up energy for your body to do healing and repair tissues and repair cells like it does all the time. I mean, cells are dying in our body and regenerating all the time. So, you know, I'm just having this vision and mindset, and I still hold it in my in, as a vision of um, making it so my beta cells start producing insulin again so I can regenerate new beta cells. Again, I don't know the details of how this could happen. Somebody might listen to this and be like, oh, well, there's scar tissue, so you can't do that, or blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't know. But I still hold the vision. I still believe it's possible. And because of that, because I was I've so strongly determined to do something that, as far as I know, again, that book planted a seed. But as far as I know, it hasn't, it hasn't been done. Like, I don't have an example. I can't give you a person say, hey, this person had diabetes for over 15 years like I have, and they've been injecting insulin for over 15 years, and they found a way to get their pancreas to completely regenerate. I don't have that example. So I'm on this path of like, I got to do anything. I'll do whatever it takes to be that person. Like, I'll go as far as it goes. And, and so what happened is, 
I ended up building this um, these habits. And once you have once you do habits, you do anything for like a year, it's like it's just like your life at that point. So um, some serious dedication to this the the fruit based approach where I get a majority of my calories from fruit and greens and um, and that's you know in my mind you know, very healing foods you know just loaded with vitamins and minerals and the water content is rich and it's just like straight from nature you know it's great stuff so uh, that's how that's how I what I'm trying to say is that's how I've gone so far like if you look at what I eat it's very simple it's you know, I can list you every single ingredient that goes in my body. Uh, I don't need anything packaged. Uh, I don't, you know, you know, like in the clients I work with, you know, I'm teaching them how to master this lifestyle and they'll maybe buy a package, you know, like a, a salad dressing and the salad dressing has like xanthium gum or, you know, some of these miscellaneous ingredients, like things like that are how big of a deal they are. I don't know, but I don't need any of that stuff. I don't, I don't you know, I eat straight ingredients yeah. like lettuce and 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 you know mangoes and bananas like just straight from nature i mean does it come out of a package i mean sometimes sometimes the lettuce is in a bag sometimes the arugula is in a bag but in general right it's just like straight ingredients straight up minimal processing we can go into this uh you know diabetes in general so minimal blending uh you know minimal food processing like literally eating the food whole chewing it getting all the fibers before they've been all you know, altered, like Jeff Novick talks about a lot of how, you know, smoothies alter the, the absorption and the surface area and all that stuff. So that's really, it's a very simple diet. It's just, it's whole fruits and it's vegetables. And, you know, it's, 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 it's very, it's the exact same thing as, I just call it a low fat plant-based diet because that's what it is. So instead of, you know, McDougal, his diet is very simple too. And so he's getting calories from potatoes and beans and rice. And I'm just getting calories from mangoes and potatoes and uh, mangoes and bananas and papaya and stuff like that. So it's the same thing. Well, you're eating what our grandparents would actually call food. There you go. <laughs> I mean, so you're unprocessed like me. I don't eat anything from a can, a box, a bottle, or a bag. The only difference I think with our diets is that I do eat the starch. Yeah. So my question is, is... Your diet is raw. Could I mean? I, I mean, obviously, most people wouldn't cook fruit. It's we don't usually cook fruit. Once in a while, there's a compote recipe. But what you know, like, why couldn't you steam some of your vegetables? Like, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't think there's any, as far as I know, I don't really think there's much science to be like, oh, I, if you cook it, it's worse. This might be some people that speculate that, but I don't think there's any good science around that. Uh, to me, it's just like. It's kind of just like a gut thing, mm -hmm. just like a, a yeah. mental gut thing. I feel good about it. Right. I feel no, good. I, I, and it, it doesn't like we have, we're about to run a retreat right now, uh, starting tomorrow. We're having diabetics come. We have fourteen people coming from all over the United States. We have someone come from Mexico. Where they Last year, that some people come from the UK. Where, where are they coming to your house or? They're coming. Uh, they're coming to Idaho, California, wow. and, and we're going to be feeding them, uh, you know, beans and and squashes and. Uh, uh, broccoli and cauliflower that have been seen, like all that stuff, like, and it's going to get amazing results. So that's all healing food. Yeah. It's just, I don't have a really good answer. I don't have a scientific answer. I don't teach or uh, preach that it has to be raw versus cooked. I think it's whatever somebody likes. And I just love the fruit. Right. But could, could I, I know there are raw foodists that will eat like raw sweet potatoes shredded. They will like sprout beans and sprout yeah. quinoa, but you're not, you don't want to do that. No, I, I don't think, I mean, in that case, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It, it, it be, it's very difficult to digest a raw potato. If you're going to eat potato, you better, you might as well, you better cook it. If you want it to, for absorption, I assume absorption and digestion would be better if you cooked it. But you don't, you don't ever miss starch? I mean, I, I mean, I find them so comforting, potatoes and sweet potatoes. So you, right. know, you love your food the way I love my food. It's just a little Absolutely. bit different. Absolutely. So... I would imagine, though, because if you're only eating fruits and vegetables, the average caloric density of your food doesn't exceed about 300 calories a day. You probably need to eat more food in, in terms yes. of volume. So could you give us an idea of like what a, a day for Robbie looks like? Okay, so absolutely. Uh, I get to eat a lot. I love I know. to eat a lot. I, don't you and, love you caloric know, density, though? It's so awesome. Yeah, absolutely. But then there's definitely like if somebody wanted to execute a fruit-based diet properly, there are some nuances. And like you just pointed to, calorie density is a key one. Whereas the unique difference is 
this is true for people who do starch too, but who are just beginning, is you actually need to focus on the more calorie-dense foods to actually get enough. Like, mm -hmm. that's the biggest mistake people make on a plant-based diet, no matter which version they're going to. Right. They're eating too many salads, not eating enough potato, they're not getting then satiated, then they all of a sudden they're starving, they go eat a cheeseburger and they feel better. And it's sure. like, it wasn't the cheeseburger that made you feel better, it was the fact that you just got some calories, you know? Yeah. So, a typical day for me would be, I eat about, I eat four times a day. Mm -hmm. So I would, a typical day, I work out in the morning, uh, and then I, uh, I would eat some breakfast. I might have a few dates, uh, one or two medjool dates during the workout. And then a breakfast would be uh, maybe like three or four mangoes, uh, maybe a couple bananas, and half a papaya, something like that. But basically, I mean, it's funny, I'm... It's funny that I only think about pieces of fruit because I measure everything to manage my insulin. So I can I could tell you the grams. Okay. Like, oh, it would be it'd be like a thousand grams of mangoes, which is like two pounds of edible mangoes. Wow. That doesn't make sense to people. But um, the point I have I eat at least three thousand calories a day because I'm very active. So at breakfast I'll have somewhere around somewhere between two hundred and two hundred and fifty grams of carbs, which is I don't know. Again, I don't know if anybody understands this. Yeah. But lunch, I would have like another 250 grams of carbs. A snack before dinner, maybe like four o'clock, I would have another 100, 120 grams of carbs. And then for dinner, I had you know, somewhere between 100, 150 grams of carbs. That adds up to somewhere around 3,000 calories. Uh, my total carbs a day is somewhere around you know 750 ish. And um, you know that's a lot of carbs, but a lot of that is coming from fiber. Um, and a lot of it coming from fructose and, and glucose, so it's it's fun. I just love the food. So, do you do you eat your fruits and vegetables together, or do you just do all fruit meals, or maybe sometimes all vegetables meals? Yeah, uh, uh, there's fruit in every meal for me, and then I try and add vegetables to pretty much every meal. So whether that's like some arugula or some romaine lettuce or some spinach with my breakfast and lunch, and then uh, my snack. And the afternoon usually has some sort of vegetable, whether that's red peppers or yellow, you know, sweet peppers. And then at dinner, it's always a big salad with, you know, maybe more arugula, maybe more spinach, stuff like that. But and more fruit. It's just fruit salad. Yeah, because a lot of people wouldn't believe that you're managing your type 1 diabetes because people that are diabetic, whatever their diagnosis, are told don't eat fruit, don't eat carbs. And you're just showing the exact opposite is true. Yeah, it's the saddest thing. I mean, the exact opposite I means for type two as well for the whole thing. They basically, they got it all backwards. Yeah. And uh, the bottom line is, type one diabetics can also be living with insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is a big problem for all people living with diabetes. And what that is is insulin resistance is basically insulin not working properly. And how do you become insulin resistant? You have fat stored in tissues that are not designed to store fat. So what that means is there's fat inside liver and muscle tissue. And that fat inside the cell makes it so the insulin does not work properly. Basically, the lock is gummed up. So the analogy I talk about a lot, which I heard from Matt Letterman, mm -hmm. is that if you had a bathtub and you turn the water on, it would just drain right through the pipe. You could, just, you could turn the water on and it would be fine. There would be no problem. And if you clog the drain and you keep the water running, eventually it will spill over the edge. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what's happening with blood sugar. So you're having too much sugar in the blood. It's spilling over the edge. It's too much. It's not going into the cells. It's not going through the pipe. So if the problem in that case is not the water, the carbs that you were putting into the tub, the water you're putting in the tub is not the problem. The problem is that the drain is clogged. And that's what's going on. So same thing with type 1. So type 2, you, you do that, you, you reverse it. Type pre-diabetes, type 2, you get rid of insulin resistance. The own, your own insulin that your body is producing then makes it so it can manage blood glucose just fine. You're good. Now, type 1 diabetics, that's not the cause of their condition, so it's not really talked about as much. They're just saying, you know, in that community, it's just like, eat what you want and inject insulin. But nobody's thinking about how important it is to know your insulin sensitivity. How much insulin are you injecting versus how many carbs you're eating is very important to analyze and understand the importance because insulin resistance is a risk factor for many things, mm -hmm. including heart disease. So the number one killer of all diabetics is heart disease. They don't die of high blood glucose readings or are going blind or amputation. They die of heart attacks. That's mm -hmm. the biggest thing. So type 1 diabetes as well. So if somebody, so for example, I'm eating like 750 grams of carbs a day. I'm taking roughly 40 units of insulin. You do that math, like 
The 24 hour ratio, I mean, I just did one yesterday. I think I had 806 grams of carbs and I had exactly 40 units. You do the math, that's a 24 hour ratio of 20 to 1. So for every gram of carb I ate, I had, or for every, yeah, for every 20 grams of carbs, I injected one unit of insulin. That's a good ratio. So if somebody, a lot of people are, you know, like in the low carb world, an example would be one of the leaders is Dr. Uh, Richard Bernstein. And he tells me less, no more than 30 grams of carbs a day. Oh my God, that's and so he's... sad though. I mean, you, I, I just I just think it's sad. How do you even <laughs> eat that little carbs? It must be just a big <laughs> diet to eat that little carbs. You got carbs. me dedicated. I'm telling you, Richard Bernstein, he's a great, he's, he's, a, he's a, I actually, I like the guy, honestly. Mm -hmm. He's got, uh, he's got an amazing story uh, and what he's done with managing his blood glucose and whatever. And I respect him. I just respect and disagree with him. But the point I'm trying to make is he injects a total of 11 units a day. So that's like way less total insulin than I'm injecting. But his ratio, so if he has 30 grams of carbs and injects like 10 or 11 units, that's three to one 24 hour ratio. So that's a dramatic difference in insulin sensitivity. And in the type one community, there's a lot of confusion around this idea of taking, of being confused about the difference between taking less insulin versus insulin sensitivity. Richard Bernstein takes far less insulin than me, but he's not as insulin sensitive. And the point is, so the people, you get diagnosed with type 1 and you're like, oh, I don't want, I don't want to take too much insulin because insulin will make me gain weight and I'll, I'll you know, insulin stores, you know, basically stores fat. And it's like this thing, it's like, so, oh, I just want to take as little as possible. I want to take as little as possible. So then they go on a low-carb diet. But what's going on here is that you, it's not a good goal to try and get to the least amount of insulin unless you knew your pancreas was producing more. So if at the same time you were decreasing your insulin, you were confident that your beta cells were producing more, then that is a good thing. That is cool. I would love for somebody to show us all how to do that. Nobody knows how to do that right now. Um, but if your pancreas is damaged and CPAP that level is low, then trying to produce a small amount, trying to inject a small amount of insulin doesn't make any sense. What you want to get to is an appropriate amount of insulin. Not too much, not too little. You want to get to the amount that you would have normally produced if your pancreas was working. So AJ, you produce insulin. Your dog produces insulin. Insulin is a necessary, required, normal hormone. There's nothing wrong with insulin. So you want to get to an appropriate amount. And when you do a low-fat plant-based diet, you get to an appropriate amount. Well, people just think that, that it's caused by sugar, not by fat. And so I love that we're both on that, the same page with low fat. Do you eat any nuts and seeds in avocado, or is it more of a treat or a rare thing? Or, uh, do you uh, them entirely? It, well, first just off, have you, you ever met somebody who got diabetes because they ate too much fruit and they're eating tons of potatoes? No. It doesn't exist, everybody. It just doesn't. No. It's crazy. No. Okay. So I eat a very small amount. I eat a, avocado would be the, the number one overt fat that I eat and I enjoy. Nuts and seeds, very rarely. Um, and basically, I, I keep my fat uh, percentage quite low. But the more importantly is, uh, you know, in our clients when we're coaching, is to keep it consistent for a type one. You got to keep it consistent. So pick, pick your amount of fat that you want to have and stay there. And that's going to make it to your... Uh, insulin and, and uh, needs are predictable and consistent. So um, we recommend a maximum of 15% of calories from fat. Closer to 10% and even lower is where we're going to see the best insulin sensitivity and the best results. That's so cool. I'm at about 12% and I don't eat any overt fats. I mean, right. I, eat, I haven't added an overt fat to my diet in over five years and I still am eating about 12% fat. That just blows my mind. That's amazing. So you have no seeds, no avocado, no nuts. Nope. I mean, once in a while, I put chia seeds to make a salad dressing as a thickener, but I stopped eating fat because that's what made me fat. And, and every now and then, I plug my numbers in. It's like, where am I getting 12% fat? I mean, apparently, Isn't there's, that fat, amazing? In, there's it, fat in everything. It's a huge topic of confusion in yeah. the world of nutrition yeah. for essential fatty acids. And people thinking, right. oh, you need to have know, this and that percent fatty acids. There's all like, these no. nut pushers now saying that it, we're basically going to drop dead or get you know dementia if we don't include at least an ounce a day. So I love seeing people that are healthy and vibrant that don't do it. So thank you for giving an, an alternative voice. Now, you're always going to be on insulin, right? There's, to your knowledge, at least right now, people on type 1. Because I thought I saw a documentary once that Gabriel Cousins did called Raw in 30 Days. And I could have sworn there was a guy in there who's now a doctor named Kurt Tyson. I thought he was a type 1 that, that got off insulin. Am I, am I yeah. mistaken about that? So let's talk about this. 
So, yes, the current state of our medical environment uh, is that, yes, if you're a type 1, you're going to take insulin until they find a cure or until they, somebody, some doctors master stem cells and can then have that make uh, beta cells function or they're gonna, you're going to have like, a, you know, the cure is going to be kind of like a medical device that does the insulin and manages your blood glucose and they communicate to each other. Like, that's, that's the current mindset. I believe, and I'm holding the vision, that uh, that would not be the case for me and that there's a way for my body to heal and regenerate and produce its own beta cells. Now, to Kurt Tyson's story. So, I actually spoke with Kurt Tyson. He's a big, uh, he's very friendly. I like that guy. He was an inspiration for me. So, uh, when I first saw that movie, Earthlings, and then started getting nutrition advice from this forum, that included people telling me to go watch that movie, Rock for 30 Days, and, and do the Gabriel Cousins program. So I did that. I watched the movie. I got inspired by Kurt Tyson's story. And I read Gabriel Cousins' books. And I followed his diet for one month, about tw 28 days, strictly. And I started taking the least amount of insulin I have ever taken. And I felt terrible. I had no energy. I felt like I was going to collapse on campus. And again, what was happening is exactly what's happening in Richard Bernstein's diet. So he's taking a small amount of insulin because he's eating a very small amount of carbs. Doesn't necessarily equate to overall best health and quality of life. So Kurt Tyson, what happened in my understanding of his story is if you watch the movie, throughout the movie, they didn't know he was technically a type 1. So he had gotten diagnosed right away. Then No, he got diagnosed. And then very soon after, like in a very short period of time, somehow got involved with this movie. So he went to fly to go film the movie, and, and while he was there, the, the, nobody had given him back his C-peptide test result. So he'd gotten blood work done before he went to the tree of life, and he did the thing where he basically ate no carbs and could get off his medications and had perfect blood glucose readings. And then he went home and saw his doctor, and his doctor showed him his blood work and said, oh, hey, Based on the C peptide result, you're actually a type one. And he's like, oh well, I don't need insulin anymore. I got you know. And I haven't heard from him lately. I don't know what he's up to. I'd actually love to check in with him. Maybe he can make a video. But as far as I know, he's still off insulin and he's still eating a very low carb diet. I don't know what his C peptide level is now. I don't know what would happen if he ate is, carbs. I'm not sure. Is he because my I, I lost touch with him. We communicated at one point because I thought he became a, a, do, a DO, a doctor of osteopathy. But when he was eating low carb. How could he do that at Tree of Life? Because from my understanding, isn't it a vegan place? Can you eat low carb and still be vegan? Absolutely, 100%. So Gabriel Cousins' program is mainly uh, oil and nuts and seeds oh. and greens. Oh, that's yuck. Ugh. I mean, yeah. uh, culinarily, I'm saying, ugh. I mean, if you yeah. like it, that's fine. But I, right. don't, I don't care for yeah, I think I think he's a naturopathic doctor. I would love to reconnect with him. I'd love to you know, see him talking okay. about what Whatever you know, works, you know. It, 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 but... Uh, I think our diet's more delicious than eating one. Absolutely, like yeah. I mean, it's a choice. I mean, somebody, you know, and I, I feel for uh, a type 1 who's just getting diagnosed and the medical community can't explain exactly what's going on and you sort of have this option. I can follow a super, super low-carb diet and, you know, maybe not have so much energy, maybe not be very athletic, not have the, you know, the fuel to, to be very active, and but I can take no insulin. You know, versus, okay, if I'm going to go do a McDougal diet, if I'm going to go do, eat a lot of fruit, I'm, at that, I'm going to have to take insulin. So they have to decide, you know, hey, my pancreas has been damaged. Do I want to live a life, uh, a, life a diet where my currently small amount of insulin production is, is going to cover me and I don't need insulin? Or am I going to accept that my pancreas has been damaged and I need to eat the diet that's best for me and best for my health and I have to inject a little bit of insulin to get to what my pancreas used to produce. That's a, that's a tough decision. I feel for people who are in that spot. Yeah. So you met, mentioned you exercise every day. Is this a habit you always had or are you doing this because it helps diabetes and how important is it? We know exercise is important in yeah. general, but is it not even more important for people with diabetes to exercise? So I grew up um, uh, as a competitive tennis player. So when I was 12, uh, that was part of the reason my family, we moved to Florida. I was uh, a very highly ranked in the northern region, so that's Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and part of Wisconsin. I was uh, ranked number one in 12s and 14s. So 
I ended up moving to Florida. So and in high school, I played tennis competitively. So I sort of had that background, that sport background of you know training and you know. So, I mean, in the summers, it was like four hours a day. During the school year, it was at least two hours a day after class. And so since college and coming out to California and working, uh, I just got in a routine of finding a, a pocket to try and get, you know, an hour or so in on a regular basis. I wouldn't say I do exercise every day. There's definitely phases where my exercise was not optimal. But right now I go to this thing, uh, it's called Base Camp. Uh, it's kind of like Orange Theory, if people heard of that, where you, it's a high intensity training basically. You, you sprint on the bike for a minute, then you go do weights for a minute, then you go back on the bike for a minute, you do that for 35 minutes, you do abs for 10 minutes, wow. and you're done. In, out, done, 45 minute class. I do that at least five times a week right That's now. That's amazing. Is it, but do, doesn't it help also regulate your blood sugar exercise? Oh yes, absolutely. It's a, absolutely. And movement and activity is just essential for life, whether you have right. diabetes or not. But of exactly. course, yes. for managing your blood glucose, it's going to have a big impact. So right. absolutely. So I, you know, you became diabetic so young, and you didn't become plant based till till almost college. Was it tough for you emotionally those years, like not to be able to drink beer in college or eat birthday cake? I mean, or was that you just like, because I, I can't imagine, like now I can I can see that, but like I can't imagine at 13, I never drank alcohol, but if somebody said to me at 13, you can't have candy cake, cookies, pies, or ice cream yeah. anymore, I would be like, I don't think I could have done it at 13. So was right. that hard for you at all to... Yeah, you know, I mean, um, I've never had a sip of alcohol in my entire life. So it's just not something I was drawn to. Good. Um, as far as the foods, I, I was just so dedicated. So I learned this book that you know, planted the seed about reversing type one diabetes. Uh, that happened in high school. So I was so motivated, so on that path, I would do anything that uh, it just didn't really bother me. Well, that's good. Now, your brother does he eat like you, or is his has his trajectory with this disease been different? No, nah, I'm like a black sheep in my family. My family. Well, I don't is see. I think you're the golden sheep. Diet. I don't think you're but the. I see. Why do they call those of us with the knowledge and the passion to do what's right the black sheep? I think we're the golden sheep. You know? uh -huh, that's a good one. I like yeah, that. Yeah. I like that. So he is, is he is how is his health though? Um, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to comment on his health. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, overall, he's he's active. He plays hockey. He's happy. He's healthy. He okay. just had a kid. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for him. All right, good. You know, I've noticed, I mean, I don't know a lot of type 1s, but it seems the ones I know tend to not be as overweight as the type 2s. Is that is that normally the case? True, or? absolutely. So type 1s, you know, it, it's, um, it's a big distinction in the sense of, like, they didn't really do it to themselves. You know, type 1s, it kind of just hit us. Like, mm -hmm. we don't know why or how, but it hit us. Type 2, you can't really get type 2 unless you have poor lifestyle habits. Right. Like, you did that to yourself. So, you know, poor lifestyle habits, you know, lead, you know, in some distance, I think, you know, that leads to weight gain. So, yes, it's true that the type 1 population is trimmer. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, there's still weight issues in the type 1 community, for sure. And people come in our coaching program, sure. uh, we, we help them lose weight because they become insulin sensitive again and they're eating the right foods. Well, a lot of people with type two would argue that it, they didn't give it to themselves; that it was genetic, and they don't. They, you know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's definitely not. So, so tell us about you. Tell us what your website is and about your coaching program, because I know you recently did a wonderful su uh, summit, and yeah. I, I don't know if it's still available for a replay, but uh, you know, yes. it's extraordinary. So, talk talk a little bit about your work, and because I want to so, I want to end um, with the, with the my favorite well my favorite part because it's something you did five years ago that inspired me, but I want to talk about your 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 work first. Yes. Okay. So um, I so we just started a new company. It's called Mastering Diabetes. And me and my it's dot org though. Mastering yes, Diabetes. Yes. MasteringDiabetes dot org. Mm -hmm. That's how you get there. And so my colleague and I, Cyrus Kambada, he's also living with type one diabetes. Wow. Um, he was diagnosed the same year I was, two thousand two. Um, he was in college at Stanford. Uh, getting a degree in mechanical engineering, then he did some work for NASA, and then at some point he decided to go back to college to understand why this diet was working so well. So he went back, he got his PhD in nutritional biochemistry from UC Berkeley, uh, and studied, a, a read a lot, and studied a lot about insulin resistance, he published some peer-reviewed papers, and um, he's just, he's an amazing guy, super knowledgeable. So we do this together. And we, we have a, our main thing is we have a coaching program. So we do group coaching where we help people from all over the world 
via uh, we have an online course, we have a private Facebook group where people can communicate with us on a daily basis, and then we have um, weekly video calls with people so they can see each other. And you know, for a lot of type ones, it's the first time they've ever sat in a room with a bunch of other type ones, let alone people that are actually following a healthy lifestyle and making these decisions. So it's really fun, those group calls. And uh, we also, um, we just did this summit, and the summit people can access, so we, it, it was, it exceeded our expectations. The response that we got and the information that, the way people received the information and started taking action just blew our mind. And so it was, ran from February 1st to February 9th of this year, 2017, and we decided uh, we can't just make this go away. Like, we can't just turn this off. So we've decided to allow people to sign up anytime, and they can, they can get access to all 25 interviews for 48 hours. So we have interviews with Dr. Neil Barnard, wow. Dr. John McDougall, Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Joel Furman, Dr. Matt Letterman, Dr. Michael Greger, uh, and a lot more. So, you know, we have um, some diabetes specialists, Dr. Wes Youngberg, and we have some testimonials in there. Uh, it's really, really great. We have Dan Butner from the Blue Zones. So there's just some amazing interviews, yeah. and yeah, people can access for free. They get That's sign up, amazing. they get 48 hours to that, pick the ones that they want to watch. So generous of you, thank you, because that, yeah. I, I mean that that you really did get an amazing lineup there. So imagine you're not going back to the Mayo Clinic anymore, unless maybe you still have relatives there you're visiting. So did you ever see one of our plant-based doctors? I mean, like I, I assume you must, or do you go to the doctor at all now, or you don't ever have to go anymore? No, so as a type 1, it's very important to have a, uh, an endocrinologist, uh, primarily because you need them to write your prescriptions, ah. uh, to get insulin and pen needles and test strips and all that okay. stuff. But, you know, it's important to continue to get checked up. So, uh, you, know, you do regular eye checkups, uh, you know, run your A1C. I just got my A1C done. It was 5.9. And that's normal, uh, right? Is that's, I mean, that's good. For a type 1, that's good. Um, you want to be, you know, somewhere into the high fives and low sixes because if you start going even lower than that, that's a sign that even number one, you're doing a ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. which you can get a very low A1C in a ketogenic diet. But if you're doing a high carb diet and you're getting a super low A1C, it's, it's a sign that you might be having a lot of lows, mm -hmm. uh, and that's dangerous. It is possible to have very tight management. We have a client who has an A1C in the fours, and she is just very diligent about testing a lot and doing corrections a lot. So it's possible. But uh, I've been doing this for 10 years, and I've never had an A1C above 6.4, which is terrific for a type 1 diabetic. I've never been hospitalized uh, for a low blood glucose, which after uh, 15 years of living with type 1 is actually pretty good too. So um, basically... Uh, I forgot what the question was. Well, do, do you see a plant-based doctor? Oh, yes, a doctor. I mean, because I, I don't know a plant-based endocrinologist. I do. I do see a doctor, but he's not plant-based. Uh, he's a, in UCLA, and he's very nice. Uh, he's aware of Forks Over Knives. He's supportive of it. He sees my numbers and says, hey, you're doing great, and your numbers are good. You're happy. You're healthy. You just keep doing what you're doing. So um, I like him. Um, yeah, and I mean, I've... I'm friends with I mean, Matt Letterman of Forks Over Knives, so I've talked to him, you know, just here and there, just about health. So uh, I don't have any problems. I'm on no other medication other than insulin. I used to be on um, uh, Claritin D. I used to get allergy problems all the time. I also, um, I, had, you know, I had like, I wore these blue boots at night uh, when I had plantar fasciitis. That was terrible. And I also uh, I had terrible acne, so I was on acne drugs uh, all through high school, and they put me on Accutane, which is one of the most serious acne drugs. Your parents have to sign a waiver because wow. it made some people commit suicide oh or God. led them to commit suicide. So, yeah, uh, I'm happy to not be on any other medications other than insulin. Wow, that's terrific. So people that come to you for coaching, whether they're 1, 1 1.5, or 2, is the diet basically the same? I mean, they get to choose certain things that they Absolutely. prefer whether they yeah, want so to eat. So the way we do it is, yeah, the basic general principles, of course, are the same. It's low-fat, plant-based. That's what's going to give you a whole food. Whole food is very important yeah. for diabetics in particular. So, you know, it's like, look, at some point, you just have to accept the reality that for whatever reason, whether you're type 2 or type 1, you know, there's always a little bit of a genetic component because, you know, why does somebody get heart disease versus type 2? You know, there's a little bit of a genetic component there. So you have to realize and accept, okay, this is the reality. And if I want good blood glucose, I got to eat whole foods. Yeah. I got to chew the food. I got to avoid pastas. 
I got to avoid flours, got to avoid bread. So our program, whether it's the fruit or the starches, is whole food, chew it, enjoy it, mm -hmm. least processed possible. Yeah. So, um, and basically, we cater to people's goals. Like, you come into our program, what do you want to achieve? And we're going to help you get there. And if somebody comes in and says, you know what, I, I, I like the firm and approach. I want to do firm approach. We can support you and guide you through executing that properly. If somebody's like, you know what, I want to do the fruit thing like you, Robbie. I'll teach you how to do that. You know what, I like McDougal. I like those recipes. I like what he's doing. I want to do, I want to do that. Like, whatever version brought them in, we're just there to, for the support, for the accountability, for the reassurance. Hey, you're doing the right thing. Hey, I woke up in the morning. I saw a high reading. Like, I'm scared. Okay. We're going to reassure you that that's okay, and this is part of the process, and here's how long it takes. So that's what we're there for. The community is amazing. People are helping each other out yeah. on these video calls. You have somebody saying, hey, I struggled with this, and someone's like, hey, I've been doing this for eight weeks, and here's what I did when I had to go to the family barbecue or when I had to go to this business meeting. So the community support is terrific. I think that's so important, whatever somebody's doing, any health goal they want to facilitate. Somebody posted on my Facebook page yesterday, well, why should I join your Ultimate Weight Loss Program? I can just do this myself. And it's like, well, because you haven't done it yourself. There's research. <laughs> exactly. People tend to succeed more when they are amongst yes. a group of like-minded people. 100%. You know, we, uh, it's funny because we reconnected uh, in, a, in an interesting way uh, through a Facebook group. You are a friend and a fan of Anthony William. And so I'm sure he's a big fan of the way you eat because I think he basically yeah. eats this way. Is there anything in his work that that, that could uh, talk about diabetes and, and where yeah. people get it? So Anthony is, um, he's a friend and he's just, um, I I just can't be grateful enough for his uh, his support and his, uh, his influence in my life. And, you know, he has a very unique position on a lot of things, and he's unique in the sense that his information is coming from uh, a higher source. It's not coming from peer-reviewed papers, and a lot of people, um, they don't like that. That just doesn't jive with them, mm -hmm. and that's okay with me. Yeah. If they're skeptical, I mean, I, that's no problem. I don't expect anybody to believe anything. I, you know, our whole program, everything we do, we teach people is evidence-based. Mm -hmm. And when something is not evidence-based, it's more like theoretical or whatever, or you know, coming from a higher spirit. We'll tell people that straight up, and you get to decide what do you want to do. But Anthony's big thing, information that he's bringing to the world uh, that applies to my life and, and diabetics, is that autoimmune conditions are misunderstood and that the body is not actually destroying itself. That what's happening is there is a virus or a bacteria doing the damage, and the antibodies are there, they're present, because they're fighting the virus. So in the case of somebody diagnosed with type 1, you have GAD antibodies and IE2. So the medical community believes and says that those antibodies are destroying your beta cells. Anthony would say, no, it's a bacteria or a virus that's destroying your beta cells, and those antibodies are trying to fight and they're losing. So um, that's fascinating information, and the reason that's a big deal, you could boil it down, but that's not necessarily new news in the sense that like the medical community there's certainly people talking about, oh, virus was the trigger. It kind of comes down to semantics. Somebody goes, oh, a virus was the trigger for an autoimmune thing to turn on, and then that's what's going on. But the reason it's a big deal is, uh, assuming it's true, then there's sort of like a restored amount of hope and trust in your own body. It's like, if, if your body truly is destroying itself, it's confused and destroying itself, and it's doing that repeatedly, how can you heal? Like, what can you do? Your body, he's like, you have, a, you have a lemon. Your body's a lemon. Versus saying, you know what? No, it's a virus. And we can do lifestyle habits uh, through food, through herbs, through, you know, plant medicine to fight that virus. And then maybe give your body a chance to restore. So it's a big shift. Again, these are things that are, are new to me as well. You know, uh, hearing that information coming from him, that's news to me. Um, how that exactly plays out in the body, how the medical community holds that and be like, uh, oh, no, look, look, I can show you this study to show it. I still need to sort that out myself. But um, the idea 
that my body is not destroying itself is really appealing to me and something that I choose to believe and move forward with. Yeah. Well, what I like about him is he's basically promoting the same diet that we are, Absolutely. which is all whole food, unprocessed, yeah. low fat, plant based diet. So yeah. I, I think he's great just because he's doing that as well. So I, I actually heard you on his radio show, and may, people might be able to access that replay. It was very good. Yes, so now, again, just Google uh, Medical Medium Diabetes Radio Show, and they'll find it on SoundCloud. Yeah, that was really good. So now the moment I've been waiting for, one of the reasons I want to interview, which has nothing to do with diabetes. So you're like young enough to be my kid. I think I'm like 30 years older than you. And I met you six years ago because you used to be the operations manager for the greatest film ever made, Forks Over Knives. And so we met. And in January of 2012, you came to my house for dinner with Brian Wendell because we had a special evening hosting Dr. Doug Lyle, who was going to be speaking the next day, uh, an event that I produced at Forks Over Knives filmed. And... So I don't even remember what happened. We talked on the phone and just maybe I invite, I don't know. We talked on the phone and you said, I'm going to be bringing my own food. Uh, you didn't say, can I bring my own food? Should I use, I mean, it wasn't me. And you said, well, I'll be bringing my own food. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was peculiar. I wasn't mad or anything. I thought, well, this is a little odd because I didn't know your exact diet, but I knew that we were sort of on the same page. And I, and, and as it turned out, much of what I made now, we, knowing your diet now, you could have actually eaten. And, and I said, okay, well, that's cool. Like, I didn't get my panties in a bunch. I wasn't like, well, then don't come. I was like, okay, whatever. I didn't think much. I didn't really think you were a kook. I just thought, okay, well, this is, you know, this is a little unusual, especially because I'm a chef and willing to make stuff. And then I thought, well, hey, God, he's bringing his own food. I won't have to pay for his food. I won't. I mean, I thought this is a good thing. So you came and you weren't embarrassed. You ate your food. It was like a big salad with fruit and whatever. And there was other food there that you technically could have eaten. You didn't. And, you know, I didn't make a big deal of it. It was one of those things that happened. And then I didn't think about it for years until I started running the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And we got into situations where people were being pressured by other people that we know as food bullies to eat food that they didn't want to eat that maybe wasn't on their program. And what you did always kind of, and I just got to thank you because you set the stage for me being able to do this in my life now. And I bring my food everywhere. As a matter of fact, I am, I mean, I, I'm not as nice as you when people invite me. I just face <laughs> it because you just said I'm bringing my own food. I, I wonder, I, next question is what would you have said if I said you can't do that? But basically now I'm proactive and if people invite me, like I, like I just went to a 50th birthday party. I passed over Saturday this year. I said, I said I'd, be, I'd be happy to come, but you need to know that I will be bringing my own food and eating it when I'm hungry. See, because what happens is you go to these Passover seders, and they're like four hours long, and, and I don't want to eat at 9 o'clock at night. And I said, if that's not okay with you, then either A, I don't need to come, or B, I'll just eat before I come. And I bring my food to restaurants, and, sure. and I feel and, – and I try to teach people to do the same, but I think women – it's a lot of times women are more people-pleasing sure. and whatever. So I want to know – and as a matter of fact, we had dinner Friday night in a place where technically there was a lot of food you still could have eaten, I saw. but So tell me – how that developed, how you got the confidence to do it, why you do it. Because a lot of people, they're going to think we're both nuts anyway. But, yeah. you know, so how did this happen? And thank you for doing that. And and also, I need to know, if I had said to you five years ago, well, if you bring your own food, you can't come, what what would you have done? And has that ever happened? Okay. Yeah. All right. This is a great topic. I think it's an important one. I will tell you that uh, living with type 1 diabetes, I sort of have an advantage in this department, whereas – because. One of the keys is is measuring your carbs. Yeah. So knowing how many carbs you're eating, so you know how much insulin to inject. So bringing your own food and knowing what you're eating is a lot easier to sort of dial in those numbers than letting somebody else produce it or you know picking out of a buffet where you kind of have to guess the amount. I you know, understand now. So, see, see, and I didn't know that because I didn't know that you had this disease back then. You know, yeah. so I wasn't I wasn't really judging. I was like, okay, whatever. You know, but now yeah. that makes sense because yeah. you actually, you know, you can actually play the diabetes card. I can't, absolutely, you know? oh, absolutely. So yeah. that's a big factor. Um, but you know, in general, I just. Um, you know, I don't know. I just, it just doesn't bother me. I don't care what people think yeah. of what I eat. It's like, this is like every, and I treat people the same way I want to be treated in the yeah. sense of like, your diet is your choice. Like you, you know, nothing, nobody's going to make me feel guilty or this or that for anything. Like if I want to not eat, you know, look, I worked at Forks and Knives for, for six years. I mean, we have Chef Darshana preparing meals and, and bringing healthy meals into the office, a sample for books and meal plan and all that stuff. And I, I just choose not to eat that. It's like, 
I don't care. If, if somebody's feelings are hurt, it's not my fault. Like, nobody's feelings were hurt. But yeah, yeah. the point is, like, that's healthy food. But you, you I think everybody has to draw a line somewhere. Somewhere. No matter what diet you're on, you have to choose where am I going to draw the line, where am I going to make it consistent. So whatever that is, is your choice, and nobody's going to make me feel bad about it or explain that, oh, what they're feeding is healthy. It's healthy. It's in the Forks of Man's book. Like, why won't you eat it? It's like, look, it's just my choice. I'm, I, you know, I, this, this is what I'm doing. And I don't need to explain it. Uh, this, is, this is my choice. So I just feel that way. And so, I mean, if you had said that I couldn't bring my own food, I would probably have said... I mean, I probably would have played the diabetes card uh, and said, like, I have to measure yeah, it. You know, understand. I understand, yeah. That, and that would get me out of it. But if somebody wants to be, like, really resilient about it, I'd just say, okay, I, 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 I would probably tell them I'll eat beforehand and not eat. Yeah. If they can't handle that, then I, and it really becomes a big deal. Then, you know, I, I would, I would try not to skip the event. I would really try not to do that. I would try and work through like what's going on, and really get them to understand how important it is to me. It has nothing to do with them, nothing right. to do with their food. And it's like, you know, look, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very, I, I genuinely am very sensitive. Like if somebody feeds me non-organic strawberries, I get, I would get a headache. Like wow. non-organic grapes, like certain things. Yeah. Like I, I need to eat. You know. Right. And also, like, just purely forget health and all that stuff, just purely satisfaction. Like, I like my food to taste a certain way, and that involves a ripening cycle. Like, my salads have perfectly ripe mangoes, and that's a game changer in the salad. Like, somebody else is not, first off, they're not going to be able to feed me ripe mangoes, and number two, they're not going to be able to feed me quality mangoes, because the amount of effort I go through to buy the best fruit, no matter where I am, I can I will stand by. I guarantee you, I have the, the right behind me are the best mangoes in the county of Los Angeles. You could not find any better mangoes. I go to the wholesale market where all the produce is. I walk through like 50 stands. I know, and I, I pass on a lot of mangoes, a lot of companies, a lot of brands that you'll see in Vons or Ralphs or whatever are mangoes I would never touch. They're not. They're not good. They they were picked too early. They weren't grown properly. So. Just in the sense of meal satisfaction, I want to eat the stuff that I prepared at, uh, on, you know, on my watch. Now, I will say, um, over the years, I've had a, you know, a lot of business meetings uh, and stuff like that. And if I go to restaurants and it's a business meeting and there's other people involved and it's kind of like a company's reputation on the line, not just me. At that point, uh, I found a happy medium where I will just order a salad. So I've had a lot of meals where I just, I literally, I've done this, I mean, countless times. I order lettuce and tomatoes, and maybe I'll add some cucumbers, maybe I'll put, you know, and that's it. Like, and I genuinely will actually enjoy that. I mean, I eat my calorie-dense food before I go or after, but, like, I actually enjoy, like, chewing the lettuce and tasting it, and it's good. In a lot of cases, that's not, you know, it's not organic, obviously, and tomatoes aren't organic. That's a little bit of a problem, but... Um, it's okay. It makes it so the business meeting is much more reasonable. But even at that point, you know, you still have to have the, the gusto to still be able to tell the waiter, like, look, this is what I want. And there's this, this little tricks here. I mean, you could pull the waiter aside and talk to the, go to the bathroom, talk to the waiter on the side. Um, you could say the best thing to do at a restaurant is to say um, whatever you do, whether you have diabetes or not, you could make it up and say you have diabetes. But you can also just say, my doctor has me on a special program. Once you get the doctor involved, nobody argues with the doctor. But once you make it your thing, like, oh, I have this. It's like people start judging you. But if you play the doctor card, sure. you get whatever you want. And I tell people, a lot of clients, I say, you know, bring your own dressings to restaurants. And all you have to do is say that there's medicine in this dressing. I have liquid medicine. I have to have in this dressing. That's why I had to bring my own. Wow. Nobody's going to argue. There technically might be some laws. In California, that say you can't bring your own food to restaurants. But I think once you start playing the medicine card, I think you're all right. I haven't looked into it. I've, so. I've, I've said I was diabetic. I've said I was alcoholic just to get things done. You know, when like when I've gone to hotels and they have these mini bar fridges, I don't want that alcohol and candy in my room. And I've said I'm, you know, because they don't people don't understand food addiction. So I say I'm alcoholic. You need to get all this crap out of here right now. And I have said I was diabetic at the, at the at a fancy theater because they were taking trying to take my food away. And they said, okay, well we have to take it away for the show, but we'll give it to you at, in intermission. You know, I wonder. You know, the other thing I love what you said because I hope other people will be empowered. I mean, if they want to think they're nuts, we're nuts. They can, but I I want to empower people to know that you you can be in charge of your food and still live 
a happy, active life. You, you're not just sitting in your apartment all day. You, we were at the party together. That's how we saw each other. And nobody was looking at you like, what's wrong with you, Robbie? Yeah. You know, it was just, it was like a non-issue. You know, the other thing I find, and, and your food is even, a, like I eat foods, I call it to the left of the red line, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. So nothing, and actually I don't, haven't eaten legumes in a year. So nothing in my diet is higher than 500 calories per pound. You, it's 300 calories a pound. And what people don't understand is if you don't eat sugar and flour and oil and nuts, you need more food. And so what I find, and tell me if this is true for you, even if there was such a thing as a compliant restaurant for our unique diets or going to a friend's house, they don't give me enough food. True, absolutely. And, 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 and I'm starving because I'm used to eating large volumes of calorie dilute, high nutrient foods, and I get nothing. I'm starving. Exactly right. Yep, absolutely. And it would cost a fortune. Oh my god! <laughs> Even if they had the ingredients, if, if you have to order eat, like if, five if, salads to get if, the salad if, that we need. Exactly. The way we eat it. That's why I don't go to restaurants. It's like we're talking a hundred dollars just to get enough food. It's just not worth it for that yeah. social day. Yeah. Well, thanks for being you. And people can think what they want, but like you're my hero because if you hadn't done that, I don't think I would have ever even had the idea that it's mm. like you said. The, somebody broke the four minute mile somebody five years ago brought their own food to a dinner party with <laughs> real fancy you know people and it stuck with me and I said why isn't this okay and it should be okay everybody the other thing Robbie and this is the big and and I don't want to say I wish I had diabetes but I, I mentioned to you at the party that I had a friend that got diabetes type I believe it was type one on his bar mitzvah and he has an insulin pump mm -hmm. and just spending the weekend with him was so interesting because he ate according to what the pump said not whether he was actually hungry or not and mm -hmm. that's the other thing I have with socialization is I like to eat when I'm hungry and if you right. call your like that dinner was at seven that's like way past my eating time we didn't finish until 10 and it's like it's just I just wish we could make this social part of any kind of diet easier and if other people watching this if you're a food bully if you're a host just please understand that it's not against you let people be who they are you know absolutely yeah. it's absolutely it's a it's a balance and it just involves communication and I think at the bottom line of the day is, you know, we should, nobody should ever be afraid to take care of themselves, do what they got to do. If the host can't respect that, then there's a bigger problem there. And we all got to remember, like, when we're getting together, you know, usually it's, it's about more than just the food. Yeah, there definitely is a legitimate connection over food a lot of times. But, like, we get to, if we can go beyond the food, just like the connection, the conversation, like, what do we want? You know, like, it's, uh, it's all good. Yeah. And I, I just want to give people permission. No one should ever eat food that they don't want to eat at yes. a time they don't want to eat it just to make someone else happy, you know? 100%. You know? Anyway, yeah. that, that, that's been great. So once again, thank you so much for talking to me, Robbie. Tell us your website, how we yes. find out about your coaching, and how we find out about your summit. Awesome. Yes. So the website is masterdiabetes.org. Uh, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll find our, the social media links. We have a Facebook page. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, we have, I have a personal Instagram account called Mindful Diabetic Robbie. Uh, you can see everything I'm eating on there. I, I'm posting all the pictures. You just watch the Instagram stories. It's just like Snapchat. You can also add me on Snapchat. I'm at Mindful Diabetic there. So, yeah, I mean, we also have a free Facebook group. So if people want to join that as a support group, uh, you can come in there and learn from other people who participated in the summit. That's really the best thing to do. I mean, if somebody's like interested, like, hey, I'm, I'm interested. I want to do this. I want to beat my diabetes. I want to have the best diabetes health possible. The free summit is the best place to start. And go to matchingdiabetes.org and you'll see the summit right there at the top. That's so nice of you to keep it available even though it has ended. And yes. you also have videos because I'm on your mailing list and you had a great video on buffalo wings and, and yes. raw ones yeah, too. We, and that, the recipe have, looked amazing. Yep. Yeah, recipe videos coming out. We'll have recipes on the blog. So uh, we're just trying to get people as much resources and information as possible to really master diabetes. And for those who need the support and reassurance and accountability, we have coaching programs for that. Good. Well, thank you so much for being so passionate about what you do and inspiring other people and helping people now. You know, obviously you have this disease and it kind of sucks, but you've turned it into, you know, good, the helping people. So that's well, I mean, thank you so much for the kind words, and I mean, thank you for having me on your show. Sure, thank absolutely. you for being an example. I mean, yeah, I was but, telling you how great it was yeah, to see you, you so, last night you know, at that so party, dumb. and how, like, look, you're looking amazing, well, and you're not you. needing all these added fats to no. absorb nutrients and stuff. No. This is I know. Like, Isn't it funny? People are like, well, if I don't put tahini on my salad, I won't absorb the nutrients, and it's like... 
guys, we have an obesity epidemic. We don't have an epidemic of, of poor macronutrient absorption, you know, or micronutrient absorption. It's like Crazy. people major in minor things. That's what yeah. I always say. So okay. thank you, Robbie, and thanks all of you for watching another episode of Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Thanks, y'all.